This is the video podcast for Chapter 10 on Wetland Hydrogeomorphic Classification. Now this is a course on hydrology, hydrological processes and ecosystems specifically, and so far we've looked at forest hydrology, rangeland hydrology, urban hydrology, so you can see we've been moving through a lot of different patches on the landscape, and it just seems natural to me that the one that actually has the word wet in it, that's something to do with water, would be a natural part of a course in hydrology. However, it's important to appreciate that the hydrology of wetlands is not something that has actually been well studied by hydrologists. Traditionally, it's ecologists who've been looking at wetlands who've been you know, forced to try to understand the physical processes that are taking place in those wetlands. Um, and so in that case, you know, the people are doing as best as they can, but we're not bringing the disciplinary firepower of hydrologists on the problem. Um, I think that really changed after 1998, when President George Bush created this policy of no net loss of wetlands you know, as a national policy, it really brought the idea of wetlands and their management or engineering or creation, you know, the physical processes of wetlands, into the national consciousness and the academic consciousness. And it really got you know, companies trying to say, hey, you know, if we want to build this road or a shopping mall, then how are we going to account for that? Um, you know, how are we going to create or mitigate the, you know, something to offset the potential impacts we're going to induce? And so that really brought on quite a renaissance that continues to this day. And what I want to do is present over the next series of video podcasts um, what I think we've learned uh, both from you know, pre-existing studies as well as the ongoing science that's taking place. Um, so we're going to be looking you know, only at the, you know, emphasizing the hydrological and some geomorphic aspects of wetlands. Um, not so much into the ecology, and so it may be that some of you are ecologists who are looking at this, and um, you know we'll see that gap on the ecological side when we're going to be focusing on these physical processes. So here I'm going to do one video podcast because it's pretty hard to break this one up into separate pieces. So it's just going to be one podcast for chapter ten, and I'm going to really focus on two things. First, what are the things that make all wetlands similar, and second. What makes them different? Um, for, put this into a little bit of historical context. Um, you should pause and read this quote. So I'll give you a second, just hit pause. Okay, so the historical context, the main thing here is just the way that within the American psyche, the idea of wetlands and their importance has dramatically changed over time. You know, wetlands were ubiquitous throughout the United States. Um, malaria was a historical problem, and you can see here, you know, talking about stagnant coves and bilious fevers, um, a desire that they're improving the land by draining and removing wetlands. Um, at the same time, uh, well, there's just a sense of biological fertility, and you know, just like the miasma and um, the way that that life is just um, so rich in a wetland context. It reminds me a lot of what you think of in the tropics, um, but it doesn't matter where you are in the world, in wetlands we see a lot of that same um, human cultural sense of what's in a wetland. However, of course we know in throughout the world there are many cultures that actually thrive and depend on wetlands and live um, with the ebb and flow of the hydrological cycle that's present in the wetland. So we're really in an era now, when we think about eco-hydrology, where we recognize that there have been dramatic changes to the state of wetlands in a country like the U.S. And in this class, I used to go through this history quite a bit more, and I, I may have some more in, in chapter 11 and 12. But for example, here in California, you know, 91% of the wetlands have been lost um, by 1980. So a pretty dramatic change over human history. All right, so what is a wetland? I mean, it seems like a pretty basic thing to say, but you know, actually, it isn't as obvious as you think. I mean, is it just land that's wet? Well, how wet does it have to be? How often does it have to be wet? Um, and so, of course, whenever you try to define something, you run into all kinds of philosophical problems. Um, but the United States Army Corps of Engineers Wetland Delineation Manual from 1987 provides the definition you see here. Wetlands are those areas that are inundated or saturated 
by surface or groundwater at a frequency and duration sufficient to support and that under normal circumstances do support a prevalence of vegetation typically adapted for life in saturated soil conditions. Well, that's quite a mouthful, and there's a lot of hemming and hawing, this or that sort of thing, but there are three key attributes that essentially are all required to have a wetland present. First, there has to be at least periodic soil saturation by water. Doesn't have to be expressed on the surface, just saturated soil. Now, periodic, what does that mean? How often is that? Um, we don't know the answer to that question, so we'll just have to leave it. Um, but that's something to think about. Now, so how do you decide how periodic? Well, first of all, if we look at number two, periodic enough so that the soils themselves have changed to fall into this hydric or anoxic classification, um, which means that, you know, flooded enough to change the soils. That's the answer for how periodic. And then number three, flooded enough that the vegetation that's present there is adapted to being flooded. So hydrophytic, you know, liking water. So that's the side of saying what makes all wetlands similar. And, and there is a whole practice to wetland delineation to say is an area a wetland or not. And that's not something that I want to go into this course, but if you're interested in that, I can refer you to the Army Corps of Engineers um, manuals and classes that they have. They're just whole procedures on wetland delineation. It really isn't that easy when you get down to the level of each local landowner's property. Okay, but the next step is to say, well, what makes different settings have unique wetlands compared to each other? Um, it's human nature to want to classify and organize any kind of system, whether they're lakes or rivers, uh, volcanoes, or wetlands. Um, and in general, there's two ways that humans organize things. One, they just look at how they look. You know, what do I visually see and, and describe? Um, can I, you know, using all the five senses, can you just say, let's group these? Um, I see ones that are around lakes. I see ones that are rocky. I see, you know, uh, that these taste bad or smell funny or whatever it is that, it, you know, chemical indicators and so forth. So descriptive classification is the long-standing type of classification um, throughout all of science. Um, it's one that isn't as used as much in creating new classifications today, but there is one that's the Cowardin U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service classification system that's based on that kind of description. More recently, people throughout the earth sciences, geosciences, you know, have come to, to like what are called genetic classifications. Now, it's not genetic in that it's actually relating to biological criteria per se, but the understanding or the philosophy that genetics is the mechanistic underpinnings of biological phenomenon. Um, that's the idea. So in earth science, what underpins the wetlands that we see? And that's what we'd like to do is organize wetlands according to their governing controls, not just based on the way they look. Now presumably, you know, things look different because they have different governing controls. So there will be some overlap between these two systems, but it's not entirely the same. And for this, the United States Army Corps of Engineers in the mid-90s released the hydrogeomorphic method, or HGM. And this has come to be very important and meaningful. Um, now, we always need to recognize that a classification system is just a conceptual way of organizing things. But of course, you can find a wetland that may blend different kinds of attributes. So it's not like we don't have to hard and fast class one wetland or another. Um, it's just a useful way as a starting point to understand what you're looking at. So the Cowardin system is shown here as, as, a, as a hierarchical, you know, kind of like clustering tree. <coughs> you can look it up on the internet if you, need, if you can't see this very well, but it, it works from left to right. And so the main systems are marine, estuarian, riverine, lacustrine, and then palustrine, which is pretty much just a catch-all for whatever doesn't fall into the other categories. So you, you can imagine that there are, um, you know, hydrogeomorphic underpinnings to those different systems, but when you get down to the next level, you know, it's, it's organized like subtitle, intertitle, title, low, lower perennial, and so forth. But by the time you get down to the class, now we're just into, well, what kind of 
you know, substrate are we looking at? Are we looking at rocky or reef or mud or whatever? So it, it gets to more and more descriptive the further you go to the right. And here's just a couple of examples. This one shows um, the estuarian class. So something in this photo, it's classified as an estuarian, intertidal, emergent wetland, persistent, which means that like it's perennially there, it's not going to dry out. Um, dominated type, so describing that the species that are here is this Carrick species. Water regime regularly flooded. Water chemistry mixohaline means that it has some salt conditions and there's organic soil. Contrast that with this polystrin class, so that's kind of the catch-all, a photo of a cypress swamp. So in this case we have a forested wetland, you know, needle leaf deciduous, as a particular type of species there, perennially flooded and it's fresh water. So you can see how the words here are just describing what you see in the photo. Um, and it's describing over a lot of attributes that is useful. But it always leaves you with saying, why? You know, why is this a flooded swamp or whatever? You know, so that's where the hydrogeomorphic method takes a little bit different approach. So the hydrogeomorphic classification looks at three broad categories of underlying phenomenon. The first is what we call geomorphic setting. Um, there's going to be a lot of new jargon or vocabulary here that you may not have come across. And the first is geomorphic. So it's a, probably a word I've used a bunch of times before in this class. It just means what's happening on the surface of the earth or potentially how is the surface changing. Um, the simplest thing is just what's the shape of the land where the wetland is located. We call that the land form. And that shape could be like a bowl, you know, it could be a, de a depression. It could be, whoa, uh, I didn't like that. Um, it could be, um, it could be on the side slope. It could be just a big flat area that, that gets wet sometimes. So what is the shape of that landform? Um, could be, you know, a delta or estuarian type of setting. Second, what is the to topographic position in the landscape? Are we at the top of a mountain, on hill slopes, in a hollow? Um, in, in a valley or floodplain or, or down by the ocean. What was its geologic history? This could be a factor, um, you know, like rate of uplift or, um, you know, exposure to different sedimentary layers that might be expressing um, hydrologic controls or something like that. So those are the kinds of questions that you ask about the geomorphic setting. In terms of the water source, where does the water come from to supply the wetland? And so here this generally means like precipitation water or um, water coming from a river like in a flood or groundwater that's discharging you know, out of the ground so it's a discharging zone. Those would be examples of the sources of water. And then the last thing has to do with the energetics of the flow through the system, what we call hydrodynamics. Um, you know, flow kinematics means what are the depths and velocities and how are they changing through time. Um, so, it, but it really comes down to, you know, how aggressive is the environment? If it's a very aggressive environment, then you can infer a lot of things. Like you're probably not going to have a lot of organic material accumulating there. It's more likely to be inorganic. Um, it's probably not going to be growing, you know, because um, it's highly energetic. Um, the directionality of the water flow is important and then just the overall, you know, force and energy with which things are happening. Okay, so the main reading that goes along with is the hydrogeomorphic classification, um, you know, guide that comes from the Corps of Engineers. It's free, so anyone on the internet can go and find that. Um, and so pretty much from here on in, I'm just going to be working through highlighting things that I think are interesting with some examples. But the main point is to just essentially parrot the information on what is HGM. And then in the next lecture, I think we look at tidal systems. And then in the one after that, we'll look at non-tidal. And then after that, we'll look at you know, functions of wetlands. And then we'll move on to floods and floodplains. So this is a summary from the, the Brinson et al. 1995 document. And it shows these seven classes. I'm not going to read through them, but you can see, we see the, the class, the water source, the hydrodynamics, um, and then examples of those classes from the eastern and western United States. And I think you can see you know, all the things I talked about, 
as to what are the causative factors are, are expressed here. The hydrogeomorphic classes have some similarity to the cowardin system, but you do see differences like um, having a mineral soil flat versus an organic soil flat. Well, that's not something that is in the cowardin system. So let's start upland to lowland. We have slope wetlands. So a slope wetland, and, and sometimes people find you know a picture's worth a thousand words. So here's a photo. Um, this is showing contours and then water, and here's another photo in a cross-sectional view. So um, as I'm talking, you can flip back and through these in the PDF file of these lecture slides. Um, so the slope wetlands, the geomorphology, generally we have hill slopes, okay, that are relatively steep, um, and usually there's something that's creating a blockage that's causing water to come out of the hillside or or maybe you have shallow bedrock so water is not going deep into the hillside and so water is available and the land can um, can saturate maybe you have a bowl shaped area that's accumulating more flow what we call a hollow um, however in most cases these hill slope wetlands they're not depressions they're just areas where you know, the soil becomes saturated often enough to meet the criteria of a wetland definition. However, if it is a hollow, it is possible that you could have a, um, a, a um, depressional kind of wetland that's a slope wetland. In terms of the hydrology, the, as I've been indicating, the source here is not from rainfall or rivers, but usually is groundwater. So water is trying to percolate in the ground, it hits a resistant layer, and then it flows out or you have shallow bedrock and so the subsurface saturates all the way through and water spills out. So groundwater and through flow are the most common sources of water um, to <coughs> create the hydric conditions. That means that um, you know, since these are on a slope, there generally isn't a lot of time for evaporation or transpiration to take place. So water is just gonna be flowing through. It's a flow through system and as water is entering from the groundwater, so too it's probably leaving. Um, there's also, in terms of hydrodynamics, um, you know, the steep slope governs both you know, high groundwater flow as well as high overland flow rates if those are, are both occurring. Um, the hydrodynamics directed down slope, so unidirectional flow. Um, and there just isn't a lot of time for material to build up. So, um, you know, generally, slope wetlands have comparatively thin accumulations of inorganic and organic sediment because with a high slope, you have a high capability to create sediment transport. So in this photo, we have the contour lines that are going across. The blue here indicates an area that's excessively wet, and the arrow indicates the unidirectional flow path. In this image, you see a flat, surface at the top and then an abrupt hill slope and there's this this pink zone here that's denoting an impermeable layer so the water is percolating in just fine but then it starts to pond on top of that and some of that then runs off because you have a water surface slope and then it runs out at that discharge point and creates a wetland until it either reabsorbs in or intersects with the head of a stream or something else uh, these are some examples of photos. Uh, it's hard to take a photo of a slope wetland in a forested situation because um, you, know, you tend to have um, a lot of forest cover and so you can't get a real good overview to see. But generally, there's just a wet meadow area that's supporting this um, you know, low shrubs or herbaceous vegetation that's present there. My favorite example of a slope wetland is in Thousand Springs, Idaho. Um, as the name implies, you know, water is flowing at one of those interfaces between horizontal bedrock layers. And actually, as a college student, I had a chance to drive out to Idaho. And one of the things I did on the very first day was drive to Thousand Springs and try to see this because I'd heard about it in class. Unfortunately, I didn't get to see it. Uh, I got there and there wasn't any water flowing. But um, you, know, you can see the contrast between the historical photo and what it must have looked like at one time compared to uh, one spot from this one photo I downloaded off the internet. <clears throat> okay, so the next type of wetland is riverine wetlands. 
and um, it's pretty much what you expect. You have a river quarter with a channel, you know, sort of in the middle or whatever in the river quarter. Um, it's surrounded by the area that's adjacent to the water, what we call the riparian quarter. And then as you move further out from there, you will have um, the floodplains. Now, you know, from a geomorphic perspective, we don't differentiate, you know, riparian from floodplain. Riparian is is either a legal definition or, you know, an ecological concept, but geomorphically, you're either on the channel or you're overbank. And if you're overbank, you're, then you're on, if you're on a depositional surface, then we call that the floodplain. And by now, you've probably seen the, um, that video I gave you on bankful discharge delineation. Um, so you have a sense of that. But often we kind of differentiate the area that's right along the river that you know may be inundated more frequently and might have a different kind of vegetation than what's out on the rest of the floodplain. So you know, if you look at, um, just skip ahead, I made these little two little schematics. So in a case here, you have you know, a relatively small channel followed by uh, adjacent to that with a, a very flat, large floodplain. Well, the edge of the floodplain, there may be that riparian fringe, but there's nothing fundamentally different about it, just the proximity of water allows for a different um, set of vegetation to be present. And we'll talk more specifically about those floodplain aspects in a, in a later video podcast. But for right now, <coughs> you can contrast something like that with this valley context where you have multiple um, you know, depositional surfaces or erosional surfaces potentially that we call terraces. And then those, uh, because of their different elevation, probably are not wetlands. So with a riverine wetland, you typically have a zone adjacent to the channel that's going to be flooded significantly more frequently, and so that might be called the riparian wetland. And then away from that, we would have the floodplain wetland that is inundated enough, again, to create the hydric conditions in terms of the soil attributes and in the adapted vegetation. Um, Hydrologically, the source of water for a river in wetland is primarily floods, but not always. If it's large and flat enough, it could be that you get enough precipitation ponding on that surface that by the time the river floods, that's already ponded. And so, for example, here where I live in Davis, California, um, there's a large area of, of land between um, you know, uh, Poudre Creek in Davis to the south and Cash Creek north of uh, Woodland, which is north of Davis, and between Cash Creek and uh, and and Puda Creek, there's a, what we could call like an interfluve. There's an area there that um, is a is a pretty much a floodplain that can not it's not vast in size, but it's large enough that it's more likely for water to pond on there and then intersect with a later river flooding than to have the river spill out. However, if you have a small area, like some people might be looking at the Yolo Bypass, for example, or, or other more constricted um, you know, valleys, then what you'll find is that the water will come from a channel and spill out onto the floodplain you know, as the channel capacity isn't large enough to carry that water. So the primary source is overbank flow, secondarily precipitation, and there's a small chance of some groundwater discharge as well but that usually isn't the main driver of a riparian, of a, of a riverine wetland. In contrast to that, the losses are primarily through surface drainage, you know, to the main river that, where there's connectivity. Now there isn't usually a lot of channel network the way you have in tidal wetlands. Um, so it's not like water is flexing in and out of smaller distributary channels. Um, so usually it's just straight overland flow. There could be some ponding or dep depression storage as well in the in the floodplain, um, so there could also then be some vertical water balance in terms of evapotranspiration. Flooding is usually seasonal, you know, driven by snowmelt runoff or monsoons or whatever is the primary wet season that governs the flooding conditions in a region. Hydrodynamics governed by unidirectional flow. Um, parallel to the channel, usually heading out, but if it's a large enough floodplain, water could be backing up onto it and spilling out. Um, so not necessarily going down the river, but going from low elevation to high elevation. And that's a little bit of a strange concept, but generally that's how flooding works. Like It's not from upstream to downstream, it's flooding from the lowest elevation to the highest elevation, usually. Um, 
Okay, so um, there are all complications to that. I can think of a lot of them. But anyway, uh, floodplains are more complicated, I can say that. Um, there's a lot of spatial and temporal complexity, and that's why I'm hemming and hawing here, because um, floodplains, you know, because they're subjected to an unpredictable disturbance regime a lot of times, um, unless it's like a regular you know, annual flooding, um, due to you know snow melt or something, you know what area is going to flood um, can vary, uh, especially if there are natural levees that have formed or man-made levees that then have to self-breach and then the water spills out into one area and not another, and you can't know where those breaches are going to happen. So as a result, wherever the water goes, then they're going to bring you know perhaps cuttings of different species that propagate by cuttings. It could bring you know sandy substrates that has a, is better drain for more upland species to grow compared to you know more hydrophytic um, species to grow. Okay, and um, you know here's a nice photo. It shows you know uh, near capacity channel spilling out onto light low grasses um, on floodplain. You can see these flat depositional surface that's, you know, you see this really dark um, green and then maybe it looks like some kind of slope and then an area that's not flooded as much and then another slope. So potentially three different depositional surfaces that are present there, each with some different vegetation and inundation regimes that are going on. <coughs> another example in a more forested context, <coughs> Brandywine floodplain in Pennsylvania. I always like Brandywine because it's um, the area where a lot of famous geomorphic studies were done and you can see the kind of information that gets studied um, here. Okay, depressional wetland is really really big. There's lots and lots of wetlands. This is almost like classically what you think of as a wetland is like you know it's a hole in the ground somewhere that's accumulated water and other materials. So just a topographic low. Um, as a res result of that um, it's actually fairly complicated because does this hole have inlets and outlets? Um, is this a groundwater recharging or discharging zone? So there's a lot of ways that the hydrology and hydrodynamics can work and it's in there that one has to spend a lot of time figuring it out. And so you know, more than any other class I would say that depressional wetlands really can occur on slopes, they can occur on river floodplains, um, they could be you know, big enough to be, you know, when does it turn into a lake? You know, there, there's a variety of these transitions um, that are there. So one of the ways to look at the depression is to see, are there any inlets or outlets? If not, then we tend to use the colloquial term bog. And what we're meaning here is that we primarily have rain that's coming down. It's not only falling on the bog itself, but it's falling on all the land that drains into the bog. And um, so, so it's rainfall driven, but it really hinges on the ratio of the watershed area contributing water to the land, to the bog, versus the surface area of the bog. So the bigger that area, watershed area, you know, to bog area ratio, then the more flooding is going to take place and the, you know, the deeper the level of inundation. Um, because water is all coming into this hole, it has nowhere to go. And so what that means is that or anything that's flowing in stays in um, you know, unless it's a dissolved constituent that can go into groundwater recharge. Water that's leaving is either by groundwater recharge to the aquifer or by evapotranspiration. Plants that are living there, when they die, then that material has to decompose in place, but it might also, you know, get consumed into the anoxic conditions in the substrate and, you know, accumulate over time is what we call peat. So you can see here this like retarded rate of decomposition plus high litter input equals high organic content. The idea of a fan as a colloquial term just recognizes that many times depressions have inlets, outlets, you know, in any combination thereof. Um, if it's flowing all the way through, then that would be a classic fan. <coughs> and you can imagine that then we have much more horizontal flow rather than vertical flow or a complex combination of everything going on and there's no easy answer. Here's a photo of a bog. You can see that there's, you know, you know, not it's actually not a lot of contributing area to it. It's just a very large bog. 
Um, you know, like the, the area of contributing land may not be more than twice the area of this bog itself. There's an area in the center where it hasn't accumulated enough sediment to be perennially, you know, vegetated as emergent vegetation, but lots of areas around it have. Probably has a very high uh, content of organic material in it. A fen, you know, this fen similarly has a lot of organic material, but you can see that there are lines in here that suggest to me that there are channels that are preferential flow paths in these different directions. And so there are inlets and outlets, and as a result of that, there can be um, a release of material stored into it, or you know, released coming out of it, um, as well as if you have a large watershed feeding into a fen, you may be bringing in large amounts of material that can then accumulate. Lacustrine wetland, basically lacustrine is just a, a fancy word for saying lake. Um, so it's just an even larger hole, but so large that, you know, that the lake essentially operates as its own water balance independently from what's happening on, on the wetland, so to speak. So we think of the lake water levels as the external control driving the wetland. Um, like if you were going to do a water balance just on the wetland, the predominantly inflow, um, it could be water, as, as water level at the lake rises, water will flow in. Um, and then if, if the lakes drops, then the water will flow out. So um, depending on where you draw your control volume for that water balance, um, you have to be very careful about that. Um, you know, of course, the lake levels themselves are probably controlled by a precipitation on the watershed for the lake. The lake itself is going to be sensitive to the ratio of the watershed area to the lake to the lake's area. Uh, the hydrodynamics are predominantly going to be governed by his horizontal bidirectional flows. So this is the in and out. Um, depending on the size of the lake, there could be wave action that's potentially erosive, or it could just be a slow rise and fall of water levels. Um, so not a very energetic horizontal flow, but in a situation where there's such an abundance of lake water that it's not like evaporation is going to dry out the wetland. In a lake wetland, um, you know, organic matter can accumulate if wave energy is low, but it can't if it's not. Um, there can also be floating mats of vegetation on the lake itself, and it can help to damp the waves. And, you know, it's not very surprising here, but, you know, this uh, gray hatching sort of indicates a wetland fringe all the way around the lake. You see the wetland represented by this aquatic and emergent fringe on the side. There could be a floating mat you know, fringe as well. And here are just some photos that show, you know, a lake is the dark water and then the vegetation is, is the lighter water. This is a side view of a site and then this is the top view of the same site. So you could imagine as these lake levels go up and down, conditions in the wetland will change. And you can see that the vegetation in the wetland is actually quite patchy as it is. Um, and so that's not going to be well explained by lake conditions, but perhaps by conditions in the river that entered it or you know, changes in the wetting and drying patterns. Here's an example of Truckee Marsh in Lake Tahoe, not too far from Davis. Um, it's an example of a, of, a, of a lake fringe where it's highly impacted by um, suburban communities around it that are contributing nutrients to that. Notice that there are distributary channels that are, um, you know, a drainage network to allow water to ebb and flow in and out of here, somewhat analogous to a tidal system, but it's not as well developed as that. Uh, this is a little bit of a detour because these aren't as long lasting, but you know, we can, some people think of beaver ponds also as essentially creating wetland environments. Um, so here is a photo of a beaver dam and upstream of that you have a pond and you know, a pond is a lake and since be, you know, if, if the beaver pond is not very long lived, um, you know, beaver ponds can break fairly easy, easily, although some have lasted for a long time. Um, so if you have a young beaver pond, then it's going to be lake with a little bit of wetland fringe, perhaps. Um, if it accumulates enough organic matter over time, then it might actually turn into more of like a bog type of, of setting. Okay, now come two really big ones that are quite different from what you may be familiar with, although you could probably picture them. The first are mineral soil flats. Now, what does that mean? 
Um, well, imagine a very large flat area um, that's, you know, like an inland area. Um, if you're familiar with the term playa, um, these are, you know, large um, drainage areas and more desert-like settings that are, you know, large flat areas, but that are wet again often enough, saturated enough to create um, anoxic soil conditions and adapted vegetation. Um, these really wide interfluves, so like areas between two rivers, like if you have a very large flat plain and then you have the area inter between, between them, the, you could have a wetland there. Um, relic lake bed or on a floodplain terrace potentially. In this case, we're looking at a vertical water balance primarily. And that's like what I was saying even between Davis and, and, and Woodland. You know, like you have a, enough rain falling down, but you're far enough away from the channel or isolated in some capacity that the rainwater fills the floodplain before the rivers can spill. And so if it's not raining, it might be dry otherwise. These are usually groundwater recharging areas, not, not discharging because there's no groundwater to discharge. The water tables can be quite deep in arid areas. Um, evapotranspiration is the primary loss because it's so much faster than the groundwater seepage. The hydrodynamics here are governed by a vertical water balance, very low energy, but unlike a bog, um, the water isn't staying there long enough to accumulate you know, a lot of vegetation that then decomposes to produce organic matter. So poor soil drainage you know, means that the water could be standing, but, um, you know, there, but it, it can dry out by evaporation, that's the key. And so there's very slow accumulation of any organic matter, even though there's not a lot of erosion that takes place. And there's low mineral uh, deposition just based on what are the processes of sediment delivery to that area. Um, you know, this photo, it's not very informative actually, but you know, it shows somewhat of a depression and just water slowly moving over the surface. In cross-sectional view, you know, a, a, um, a, a, a boundary along the bottom, like, you know, here's the channel or, or a depression. And so shallow groundwater that's saturating, held up by an impermeable boundary. Um, here's a photo from a wet prairie um, that I took off the internet. <clears throat> okay, so the organic soil flat wetland, um, why is this different from a mineral soil flat? Well, as you're about to see, a dramatically different setting. And the first thing is that we often think of these as associated with very lowland areas close to the ocean where there's a lot of opportunity for organic growth. Um, we generally divide, divide the coastal zone into what we call siliciclastic shorelines, like, you know, clastic meaning particles, sil silica meaning like silica based. And so like most continents are, are um, eroding away sediment that what we call siliciclastic, not all, but a lot of it. And, um, and then separate from siliciclastic shorelines, you have what we call um, carbonate coasts. So carbonate you know, are areas like um, around Florida, like the Everglades or the Bahamas region, you know, places that um, are more tropical and have um, more carbonate dominated, you know, maybe accumulation from reefs or, or other organisms that can take up calcium, produce calcium carbonate um, materials. So organic soil flats are these very large flat areas um, usually at the most bottom land areas. They can be depressions, but they may have been completely filled in, or they may not be depressions per se. Um, they, like, or, like the inorganic, the mineral flats, they're rain dominated, you know, usually have more of a vertical water balance, but not always. There can be regional horizontal sheet flow, like as occurs in the Florida Everglades. Um, again, very poor soil drainage, but here we do tend to have an accumulation of organic matter over time. And I've already mentioned the Everglades a few, a few times. Um, the Everglades are located throughout um, you know, a region of south central Florida. Um, the National Park is shown here with this hatched area along with Big Cypress Reserve. But really, you know, the whole region going up to the Kissimmee River and into Lake Okeechobee. But if you look here, like Historically, as Lake Okeechobee, um, when it would fill up, like the whole of this south central Florida 
was a lowland depression, and then there are these um, higher areas along the coast, which is why Miami and West Palm Beach and all that have, have formed up on those little bit of highlands. All these lands, though, are made out of calcium carbonate rocks. Like, when you see the soil in Florida, it's white, you know, like there's no rock there, so to speak, other than coral or carbonate-based rocks. But those are very, very weak rocks. Uh, and so what happens is when the water overflows Lake Okeechobee, it would just flow like sheet wash on a sidewalk down through this area um, into these different regions. Here's a photo from about 1900 that shows the Everglades and just these vast areas of these like, you know, what was what's called sawgrass. And then you can see these mounds or also more specifically called ridges that are have a very different, more upland vegetation dominated by trees. Um, of course, this area has undergone dramatic change. There's a little bit of a detour, but you know, if you compare the pristine situation you see in the top photo as well as in the schematic, um, there's a lot of studies trying to understand why there's a ridge in the slough, but in this case, like this is proposing that there's this underlying carbonate setting, and then over time, over a very long time, organic material has built up, in some cases forming ridges, and in other cases growing slower, forming these sloughs. Um, today, the ridge and sloughs have been degraded, they've been chopped up, there are power lines that run through there, um, ponding has created, you know, um, disconnectivity between the ridges. Okay, and then we have tidal wetlands, and um, you know, tidal wetlands, of course, all of the coastal regions are going to have tidal wetlands, um, both along the marine, you know, ocean boundary, as well as in estuaries and the estuary and fringe. Uh, we'll talk about what tides are. It's not as easy as you think, but we'll get into that um, next time. Um, they can be depressions, but they generally tend to be lowlands. Um, you know, geologically, we have sea level rise and fall over thousands of years. For the last 18,000 years, sea level has been rising. And in the last 4,000 years, sea level has slowed down its rate of rise. And so now it's fairly stable. And as a result of that, extensive tidal wetlands have established in the last 4,000 years around the world. <clears throat> Hydrologically, water fluxes are dominated by the ebb and flow of tides. These are vast quantities of water compared to precipitation. Um, it's essentially like a flooding in, in environment. Winds can enhance tides by blowing more water in and out. Um, there can be areas that inundate less frequently, what we call supertidal plains. And, you know, the hydrodynamics are bidirectional flows. Um, tidal wetlands can accumulate a lot of organic material, but not always. Some places are receiving a lot of inorganic sediment, you know, faster than organic material can accumulate. So it really hinges on the ratio of the watershed area to the wetland area. If you have a very large watershed feeding a small wetland, you're probably going to be inorganic dominated. If the opposite is true, it's going to be organic dominated. And here are some photos of the salt marshes of Connecticut. You know, that's, that's where I did a lot of my undergraduate work and beautiful places like that. And then I did my PhD, the photo on the right, the tidal freshwater marshes uh, of Otter Point Creek in Chesapeake Bay. Um, in both cases, you can see clear zonations that are taking place. Um, in tidal freshwater, zonation controlled by water level inundation. In salt marshes, the salt being the primary control more than, the, than water itself. Okay, so that's the summary, and then we'll pick up next time looking at tidal wetlands in more detail.